The Outdoor Atlas Studio Sessions are brought to you by Fish Hunter Portable Sonar, Know Where to Cast, Sundog Eyewear featuring True Blue Lenses, and Mark Melnick Outdoors, Time Outside is Time Well Spent. There's an old fishing quote that says, 95% of the fish are in 5% of the water. Know where to cast. For more information, go to fishhunter.com. Hey everybody, welcome to the Outdoor Atlas podcast sessions. I'm Mark Melnick. Coming to you the week of March 9th in 2015. This is our first video podcast and I think it's going to go really well. If you have any questions or you have anything you want to address, please feel free to send me an email at mark at outdooratlas.com. I'll be more than happy to address anything you can, anything that I can. If, uh, if you need some help, if you have any questions about gui the guiding industry, the television industry, or fishing in general. So I am very fortunate to have been able to travel all over North America and the Caribbean doing the guided TV show, and I've come across some very unique people. I'm going to introduce you to one of those guys right after this. You can swim, but you can't hide. Introducing the new Mark Melnick Signature Series of Sunglasses for Anglers by Sundog Eyewear. Game-changing Mellow Lens technology features superior polarizing filtration, which is essential for spending time on the water. The polarization of the lenses are a game changer. Surface glare is cut so you can see into the water, no matter the condition. So you can catch fish like this and this. Fish like this. And the exclusive Mellow Lens filters the blue light that reduces veiled glare, resulting in improved vision performance and greater protection long term to catch more fish. Like this. Like this. And fish like this. Available in three great styles. Phantom. 22 degrees, halo. A full day outside with zero eye fatigue separates Sundog Mellow Lens from every other brand I've worn. Order yours today with free shipping. Available exclusively at sundogeyewear.com. You know, I had the fortune of running into Jim Sammons for the first time probably five, seven years ago in a parking lot in San Diego. We've been working to get together to do a... Uh, a TV show called Real Road Trip on sea kayaking or bay kayaking, catching a bunch of fish. Jim, thanks for joining me. How are things in uh, sunny San Diego? Well, definitely sunny. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, nice and warm here. I close my door in here because my dogs are outside. Um, it's uh, it's going good, man. You know, we uh, I just got back from a trade show and sharing uh, sharing all the the goodwill of kayak fishing and showing off my new boat and. Just, uh, it's going great. <laughs> Tis the season for the uh, for the the conventions, isn't it? Are you on the road a lot doing that? Uh, you know, not not a ton. Luckily, I don't have to lead the trade show life like some guys do. Um, but I do about five of them a year, and uh, that's plenty. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I feel you. I mean, it's it's a lot of time on your feet, a lot of walking. Are, are you there soliciting sponsors, or are you there to? Uh, satisfy sponsorship uh, requirements yeah it's more i'm there for sponsors um i'm also a guide so you know i'm schlepping my own business uh at some of them so it depends on the show these uh the last two shows uh are are semi-local shots so shows so i'm talking about my guide service but i'm also there with the kayak manufacturers and uh you know jackson kayak i'm usually there for them and uh Again, you know, I've got a new boat with them, so uh, showing that off to people, which is always a lot of fun. I bet, I bet. So let's go back to where this all started. How did you get involved fishing in the ocean on a kayak? Well, I mean, I, I think it was a lot. I mean, of course, this was a long time ago, you know, over, well, over 20 years. Are you a pioneer of the sport? Some have called me that. Um, some have called me... The godfather of kayak fishing. I don't try to put labels on myself. I've just been. I just say I've been doing it a long time. Uh, you know, there weren't too many of us out there for at the beginning. That's for sure. So yeah, I mean, I, I just I couldn't afford a boat, and uh, I was a surfer. Uh, you know, so we would go surfing, and if there was no surf, we'd just grab a rod and paddle out to the kelp beds on our surfboards. 
and uh, I got introduced to um, paddling, paddling touring kayaks by my uh, father-in-law, and um, so I'd go out paddling with him in these 18-foot fiberglass boats, and they were awesome, but I'm like, I'm looking around going, man, I'm getting to places that a lot easier than that surfboard, so maybe, maybe this is the route to go for fishing rather than the surfboard, but the sit-inside boats just weren't really conducive to it. Um, so when I saw the very first sit on tops, I'm like, this is it, this is perfect. And it changed my life. You know, I've been, I I mean, I said it literally changed my life. It, uh, I became a guide, um, about 20 years ago. Um, and I've been guiding full time for 13 years and heck now I'm shooting for my seventh year on the air with our TV show is, uh, we're shooting for our seventh year on TV. It's, it's uh, hard to believe it's gone by so fast. I know I'm, I'm in the same boat. You and I both started our television on air hosting careers in the same year. And it, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a wild ride for, for you and for me, it's been absolutely great. Now, when you first set out on, on a kayak in the ocean, fishing the kelp beds, number one, what were you fishing for? Number two, what's the element of danger involved in, in being in big water in such a small boat? Well, I never felt there was any danger, uh, but of course, at that time, you know, I was much younger and bulletproof, you know, you, you don't even sense your own mortality at that time. So I didn't even think any, any danger because I was doing it anyway. I was doing it on surfboards. So the kayak actually felt much safer, <laughs> but you know, there's just certain skills and, and things to learn. And, and then I consider what I say, like when I'm doing my seminars uh, a lot, it's like I consider kayak fishing to be an extremely safe sport. Unfortunately, there's guys who get on them who aren't real safe. Right. And that's where people run into trouble. But yeah, I mean, so our first our first forays out there were, um, for me, was usually going out after calico bass. Um, I love fishing the calicos and the boiler rocks because, again, it was the same stuff I was doing on my surfboard. Um and on the surfboard, you didn't have the range you have on a kayak, so I usually stayed in a little bit closer, uh, fished the boiler rocks, and then just at the kelp. So that's what I was doing was fishing the calicos mostly. But once I got into the kayak and you know a little bit longer, then we started getting out after the the bigger stuff, the yellowtail, white sea bass, thresher sharks, you know, the big stuff we can get on. What's the biggest fish you've caught out of a boat? Out of a boat, not very big. Out of my kayak. <laughs> That's what I mean, out of your kayak. Yeah, uh, out of my kayak. I've, uh, well, I mean, there's been some really big ones. Um, the biggest one that was ever actually weighed that I brought in was a 172 pound thresher shark. Um, I've caught bigger marlin, but of course, those were caught and released, and I never keep thresher sharks anymore. That was, that was like a long time ago. Um, and uh, so we've had bigger. Bigger marlin, um, stripers usually. We've hooked some blue and black marlin, but we've never landed one. They're just, <laughs> they're just too crazy. Um, so, so when you when you hook into a marlin, do you tie yourself off to a mothership of any kind, or are you just at the at the fish's whim and they just pull you for miles? Yeah, exactly. You just get you just go for a ride. Um, generally speaking, we're with a group of guys. Um, so when one guy hooks up, the other guys goes, "Okay, we're done fishing." And, you know, we'll go help out the guy who's on the fish. So what we usually do is just everybody just kind of hangs onto the back of each one's boat and just let the fish tow all of us. I mean, we've had we had a, a marlin dragging four guys for in kayaks plus a swimmer um, guy, a diver with a camera was in the water and he was hanging on the back and it was towing us all like we weren't even there. So typical manual drag, you're actually losing, using your own drag in the water, your, your boat's drag in the water to, to try to slow this fish down. Does, does conventional tackle drag even matter when you're fishing out of a kayak? No, you can really like tackle fish in a kayak. Um, I, my biggest threat, I got a thresher shark of 67 pounds on six pound test. Uh, the reality is the kayak is drag a bass i mean if you remember a bass this big will tow your kayak it'll get the boat moving so when you get on these big fish um they really they really get you smoking um so what i always tell people like when we're fishing around the kelp beds for yellowtail is don't give the fish line because you're already giving the fish your boat right you're never pulling as hard as you think you are in a kayak because the boat's moving so Again, you can get away with lighter tackle, but you can also get away with tighter drags. 
if your skills are there. You don't want to be too locked up and um, have an erratic fish that you know, changes direction all of a sudden pulls you off. But um, I learned in new, fishing in New Zealand, we were catching big yellowtail kingfish there, and uh, they were just smoking us and rocking us. So I kept tightening my drag, kept tightening my drag until I got to the point where, I mean, I was fishing 80-pound braid with 80-pound leader and darn near locked up to get these fish, keep these fish from going, getting me in the rocks. So it was a uh, fish really tight drags. It's fun. <laughs> uh, it sounds like it's an absolute blast. And you know, you see a lot, a lot of people that are, that have adopted it for freshwater too. And, and you know, the freshwater angle of it, as you alluded to earlier with, with your surfing analogy is you really can get into the back nooks and crannies where, you know, a lot of people can't get, you know, and, and it's total gorilla, isn't it? Oh, totally. Totally. I mean, um, well, I was just in, uh, the Everglades and we were fishing, you know, through the mangroves, going through these mangrove tunnels and getting to small lakes that there was absolutely no way you accessed it with anything other than a kayak. Cause you couldn't walk in there because of the mangroves and the mud and you couldn't get a boat in there because sometimes you're going through water this skinny and, you know, through mangrove tunnels, obviously. So that opens up, you know, like I said, that, that, that whole thing of going where the big boats can't go. Uh, that is so appealing of kayak fishing for me in the salt water is getting in the kelp beds in the really thick kelp that the boats can't get or into the boiler rocks where the boats can't get. So there's that aspect of kayak fishing that is just super appealing, getting your own piece of water that nobody else can get into. That presumably a lot of big fish, you know, in tide, especially in tidal bodies, you know, big fish will go as the tide comes in, they'll go in, back up into those back mangrove pockets where boats can't get. And you've got a, it's, it's a whole new ball game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, some of these places tailing redfish or tarpon, um, just way back in there and, you know, where you wouldn't even expect them. And in the, like I said, in the salt water, in, um, in the, in the boiler rocks, way up tight in that super surgy water that you don't want to put a $50,000 boat in, you know, I can put my kayak up in there and, you know, those big fish just love that turbulent water. So, uh, they just sit back in there and wait to ambush stuff. So getting the, getting the lure up in there, it's, that's that's my thing man i love that you mentioned new zealand where are you in your shooting schedule right now are you uh beginning finishing in the middle what's going on well we just um just finished for last year we were actually running a little late because we had some weather issues last year everybody did man the wet mother nature was one grumpy lady last year for sure yeah yeah we had to cancel several shoots i mean we had a shoot to cedros island in mexico that gets you know they get like a quarter inch of rain a year um, on average. And of course we schedule a trip and they get a hurricane. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. So it, it was kind of screwy. So, um, the, uh, we were in Panama and then went directly to the Everglades. So that wrapped up last year's season, but I'm already, you know, working on now on shooting for this year. So, you know, we have a trip coming up to Costa Rica, then to, we're going to Spain, Belize, um, I can't even remember all the places. We're doing a road trip down Baja. Uh, got all kinds of fun stuff on the schedule this year. That sounds amazing. That sounds amazing. Now, what uh, what do you do in your off time? You mentioned that you're a guide. How's it fishing these days? Well, I wish I could say I knew because I have been doing the trade show thing. Um, so I haven't even been on the water locally. Uh, I just got home from the trade show yesterday, so wrapping up some paperwork, and I'll be back on the water with clients actually tomorrow. So uh, luckily here in San Diego, we've had, in California in general, we've had very warm water on the coast. It never got very cold. So we've had good yellowtail fishing um, all winter, which is, you know, predominantly a summertime fish. But these fish have just stuck around. A friend of mine saw Dorado off kelp beds in Malibu uh, last week. Really? That's just unheard of. How deep is that? I mean, like I said, just off the kelp, 75 feet of water. Wow. And he said they were just cruising around following a bait school he couldn't get him to eat anything he said he threw everything he had at him and that's crazy and that couldn't get him to eat but they were cruising around uh, yeah it is crazy but crazy things happen i mean i caught my first marlin right in front of scripps pier in la jolla um back in 98 you know if you have the right water event um it's good I and mean, it's looking like it's going to be a really really good year that's incredible. That's incredible. So tell me what a typical guide day is like with you on, on a kayak. I mean, it's not like you're running, you know, 50 miles in one direction to get to the fishing grounds. Go through a day for me. 
Well, it, it, because it's a, you know, I don't do big groups or anything like that. I do, you know, private, semi-private thing, you know, so one, two, maybe three people. Um, and because most of my clients are beginners, I, I consider my guide service an instructional guide service. I'm all about teaching people how to do it. So we usually spend about an hour or so on the beach covering, you know, basic skills, you know, paddling, self-rescue, you know, you got to know how to get back on your boat uh, if you do fall in. Um, and paddle strokes. Paddling is all about efficiency. Kayak anglers are historically terrible paddlers. You know, they just want to go fish. So I want to make sure they take the time to learn how to paddle well. Um, so, yeah, we go over all that, you know, if, if they need that. And then um, we launch. And it, if, if they are a beginner, we usually do the San Diego Bay thing uh, because they get the repetition of landing a lot of fish. You know, a bad day on San Diego Bay, I'm going to catch a dozen fish. You know, on a good day, we might catch a hundred. Yeah. And so they get the repetition of dealing with gear, moving around the kayak, just getting comfortable on the boat in more of a flat water situation. So, you know, f at first it's just, you know, very instructional and then it just turns into let's just fish. And I fish alongside of them because in all honesty, you know, we're not sight casting to anything like that. So as I tell them, I go, I can't rely on my client's abilities to catch fish to let me know if the fish are there and biting. So I always toss a line out in the water and basically just so I can, I know what's going on. I know if they're biting, but I can also show them exactly how to do stuff because some people just don't get it, you know, through talking them through it. I actually have to, I'll actually throw in a line. Okay, we're both going to cast at the exact same time. We're both going to let out the exact same amount of line. We're both going to throw it in gear at the same time, and we're both going to wind it exactly the same. And all of a sudden, somebody who's not catching fish all of a sudden, whoa, okay, gotcha. now I get it. <laughs> but it's hard to walk, walk somebody through that just talking, because unless that reel's in my hand, it's hard for me to kind of that feel for it. Exactly, and I've and I've experienced I've experienced San Diego Bay with you, and it was I mean there was a ton of fish caught that day. Uh, then we went outside, and and it was a little bit tougher. But you know the San Diego area really does have have it all for people that want to fish both from boats and from kayaks. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, like I said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of water here, San Diego Bay, Mission Bay. And then of course, all of our coastline. Um, and the beauty of course, the kayak is if you have the skill level anyway, if you can reach the water, you can launch there. Yeah. Oh, you know, I can launch through any surf. Um, and, and of course, La Jolla particularly is kind of a protected launch. There is surf there, but it's not generally not very big because it gets blocked off by the point at La Jolla. So it, it's generally a good launch. And then you just have a, a one mile paddle from that launch to get to where you can start fishing. So you have to, we have to paddle through a protected area, but then, you know, then you have the kelp beds, you have the La Jolla Canyon. So we have a lot of upwelling there. Uh, we have live squid. Um, so we'll catch that for bait a lot of times. We'll get live mackerel for bait. And then it's like I said, we, we get big yellowtail and white sea bass and halibut and threshers and, you know, all kinds of bottom fish and of course you know the calico bass and sand bass I and mean, there's a lot to fish here and it's it's really a year-round fishery there's always something to fish for here so as a guide a person that is is as you say an instructional guide i'm sure well you can answer this for me do you have a lot of turnover because people get it or do you have a lot of repeat business that people enjoy fishing with a guide? I mean, it would seem to me that once once you're comfortable in a kayak, you can go and get your own, get it outfitted, and you don't need a guide anymore. Do you see a lot of turnover in your business? Yeah, that's basically what it is. You know, I teach people how to do it, and then I never see them again unless they want to come on. You know, I'll do the Bay Trip, and then they want to take the next step and do the La Jolla Trip. So they get they can kind of get dialed in on those two things, and then they usually want to just kind of figure out the rest on their own and just spend time out there. Just time on the water is the key. Um, or they'll come on a guided trip if I do a group trip down into Mexico or something like that. And then um, the repeat clients I tend to get are visitors. I get people who you know are visiting San Diego every year, and they'll book with me every year. But the I guess because I'm really known as an instructional business, you know, where I'm teaching people how to do it, 90% of my business are locals. So, or from the LA area, San Diego area, so they'll drive in here, but uh, they want to get that, that base education, feel safe on the water. Um, let me harp on them about my um, feelings on wearing PFDs and because <laughs> I hammer everybody. Oh, you have to. Yeah, it's, there's too many guys out there who don't wear them. 
and setting a bad example. And unfortunately, like I said, I consider this a safe sport, but there's unsafe people out there. And I hate to say it because I do think it's such a safe sport, but guys die doing this sport every single year. And I mean, a guy died last week and just same situation, um, you know, went out in bad conditions that were over his skill level, went in the water and uh, my dog just walked in. Um, and uh, Jasmine. Um, couldn't get back on his kayak. Um, he was a young man. I mean, like I said, young and bulletproof. Um, unfortunately, he didn't make it. His kayak did, though. His kayak survived because his his PFD was strapped to, to the kayak. kayak. Yeah, you know, <laughs> it makes you wonder what people think, right? Sometimes, I mean, it's all it takes is one one small rogue wave to knock you over, or or as you said, a fish to turn left when you think it's going to turn right, and and you can go over very easily and, and things, uh, the, what I try to tell people is things go wrong in a hurry. You know, you don't wear a PFD for that time. You jump off your kayak and then you're going for a swim. You know, it, things go wrong in a hurry. Um, I got yanked off my kayak once by a sea lion. I mean, just this weird chain of events, uh, that allowed him to get a hold of a fish that I had on a lanyard that was on the deck of my boat, but all of a sudden wasn't in on it. You know, it fell in the water and a uh, sea lion grabbed it. And all of a sudden I'm in the water. I always tell people, if you want to see how quickly things can go wrong, look up the video, Kayak Angler Hit by Boat on YouTube. If you look up Kayak Angler Hit by Boat on YouTube, there's a short video. A guy was sitting in a river, had his GoPro running over his shoulder. Uh, he's anchored up, just fishing, you know, and, and all of a sudden you hear this, zzz, and bam, he gets sideswiped by a boat. Nothing wrong happened. I think his paddle went floating away. Nothing bad happened, thankfully. He wasn't hurt, nothing. A little shaken up, I'm sure. But it just showed how quickly things can go wrong. If that boat was at a different angle and T-boned him instead of kind of bounced off him, you know, it, it would have been a whole different story. Um, and that, like I said, that just shows how quickly things can go wrong. So, uh, like I said, I'm very passionate about, about it because I, I hate to read that somebody was, um, was killed doing my sport. It's bad for my business. You know, it, it's, it's bad for the sport, you know, having people die and, and, and you just, it's not that big of a deal. The PFDs are made for paddling. They're quite comfortable. You get used to wearing one. You wear one all the time. I mean, I have a small boat as well and I wear my PFD all the time in my boat. I don't go on my boat without a PFD on, you know, it's just, and I'm a great swimmer. I've spent my life in the ocean. Well, it's, you know what, it becomes a, an essential part of your equipment if you have the mentality for it. Just like when you go fishing, you bring your tackle box. When you go on the water, put your PFD on, wear your life jacket, it, it, you'll forget that it's there in no time flat, and you never know when you might actually need it. And all it takes is, you know, a bump on the head and to be knocked out or something like that or take a... Well, know. right, right. Like I said, things go wrong. I had a thresher shark. I was out uh, in La Jolla. I had a thresher shark free jump. I mean, I was just paddling. Thresher shark free jumped right over the bow of my boat. I mean, it wasn't hooked up to anybody. It just jumped. Now, if that had hit me, I was I would have definitely gone in the water. You know, if it hit me in the chest, it hit me in the head, I would be injured. You know, and that PFD may give you that few extra minutes. And, and, and in cold water situations, you know, you get hypothermic so quick, and people don't understand hypothermia, your arms start stop working. You know, that PFD may give you that few extra minutes on the surface where somebody could help you. You know, so that's why I'm, I'm so passionate about it, you know, and it just, you know, it's not like we have people dying left and right on kayaks, but to me, it just happens too often to ignore. And nobody can, people who argue with me on PFD, well, nobody can argue with me about the PFD arguments going to get anywhere. You know, oh, it's too hot. They're uncomfortable. Oh, I can, I can grab it if I need it. And I, you're not going to win that argument. Oh, it's my right to make that decision. Well, don't think about yourself. Think about your family. Think about the people on shore who will mourn your loss. That guy who died recently had a young child. I mean, a baby that is now doesn't have a father. You know, and that's that's what really gets to me. Just tragic. You know, and it's completely avoidable. Completely avoidable. So what's, what's going on with you next? What's coming down the road for Jim Sammons? Well, like I said, I just introduced, um, just within the last couple of months, introduced the Kraken which is a Jim Salmon signature boat with Jackson kayak. So just spending a lot of time promoting that. 
And other than that, just uh, spreading the joy of kayak fishing through my show. You know, we, we have the, the two shows on WFN and NBC Sports. So um, just just shooting, exploring the world. You know, there's not a lot of people who have been able to have the opportunity to do what I've done. Um, you know, I've kayak fished on the Nile in Uganda. I've kayak fished on the Arctic Circle, um, New Zealand, Costa Rica, both coasts, you know, tarpon. Uh, Marlin. So, you know, I, for me, it's it's just having fun and, and, and experiencing the kayak fishing communities all over the world. Is it a growing sport? Kayak fishermen all over the world now. <laughs> Is it a growing sport? Oh, it's, yeah. All over the world. Uh, it's funny. It's It tends to start off, for whatever reason, the sport tends to get its roots. And that's how it really started, was on the coast. It really does get going in salt water. Uh, so it's growing all over the world in the salt water, and then it migrates into the inland waters. Um, there, you know, it's good. It's becoming huge in the freshwater bass market. Um, you know, I'm not a big bass guy. That doesn't really turn my crank too much. But I mean, it's fishing, so I love. You know, I'll go fish for anything. But that's why you see the uh, all these different style of boats now. You know, we have so many boats that are are made for standing up in, uh, so you can stand up and sight cast these fish. These ridiculously stable boats. Um, and you know, there's a boat for everybody, for every type of fishing. And it just, it just keeps growing. I mean, I, I was on, I was sitting here at my computer not too long ago and I got an instant message, I think on Facebook, uh, from a guy who goes, um, Mr. Sammons, I'm watching your show right now in Portugal. And I'm like, that's so cool. He goes, yeah, we have this whole group of guys who are into kayak fishing now and, it's it's amazing. I mean, how how the world has shrank because of the internet and that, and how the 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 word about the sport because of things like Facebook and YouTube and all that, you know, it's short. Those things shorten the learning curve for everyone. So it just it, it's got mass appeal. And it's got mass appeal around the world for the exact same reasons I got into it to the begin with. It's a lot cheaper than buying a boat. And the cool thing is about it is that it is cheaper than buying a boat. It's accessible to everybody, yes. and it's a lot of fun. It's a it's a it's a great way to spend the day. Uh, it, it's incredible. Um, you know it, the peace and quiet. You know the only thing you hear is your paddle going through the water as you're gliding through, and then the sounds of sea life. You know um, we have close encounters with whales out here all the time, uh, dolphins, seals, sea lions. You know, and just here I always try. It's kind of hard to explain to people, but. A lot of times there'll be a bait school and, you know, you're always scanning the horizon for, for, you know, little puddles of bait. And a lot of times you'll hear them before you ever see them. And that's something you don't get from boat fishing. You know, you don't hear bait over motor noise, you know, so that there's that just intimacy with your surroundings and the, because you're so quiet, the close encounters you do have with nature. And that's all before you start catching fish, you know, and get that ex that thrill of getting towed around. Uh, I mean, I was I was in Louisiana fishing uh, for big tuna with a buddy, and he hooked into a tuna, and got towed so fast that I couldn't catch up with him. <laughs> and, and that's yes. never happened before. I mean, I've had plenty of guys catch marl and everything else, and you can usually you know work your way up to him. This guy was flying across the water. I mean, it's just a you know, wake coming off the bow. I mean, it's really something to see and experience. And, you know, when you get your first kayak sleigh ride, uh, that's when your addiction will really start. <laughs> well, it's funny because you talk about the serenity and the quietness and, and, and the, the peacefulness of being a kayak angler. But in my opinion, really, it is quite an extreme sport. And it's extreme as you want it to be. You can be safe and you can be quiet and you can, or you can go balls to the wall and lock horns with a thousand pound blue marlin and just yep. see how you do that day. I mean, not many sports have that versatility. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's why the sport has grown in a lot of aspects. You know, when I started this sport, it really was the poor angler sport. You know, the guy who couldn't afford the boat. That's all the only guys who were doing it. Guys who were graduated from their surfboards to kayaks. Um, so quite honestly, like for my guide service, I couldn't charge hardly anything. Um, because it was the poor guy, you know, we were all making all our own stuff. There was nothing manufactured for kayaks. You made your own rod holders. You made your own mounts for, uh, fish finders. 
Uh, you made your own bait tanks. There was just nothing out there that was manufactured. And we were all these poor guys trying to get on the water that didn't have a boat. But over the years, the sport has become more mainstream. There are these custom, you know, boats like the Kraken um, and accessories. And instead of being that poor guy, I mean, you've got professionals on the water. You've got, you know, your doctors, lawyers, businessmen who are looking for an escape from that, you know, the stresses of that just to be on the water and not have to deal with coming home and washing a boat, you know, and, and looking for that excitement of landing a big fish. Um, or like I said, you're just getting away from the office and no phone, you know? <laughs> yeah, I hear you. So how do people get in touch with you, Jim, if they're interested in t- taking the plunge and, and starting a, a career in the kayak? Well, the, the best way is really to, um, I, I've got what you would call, I guess I call a portal website now because we have so many websites for the TV show and my like guide service and everything else. So if people just go to jimsammons.com. So um, that will direct you to any and all of my websites. Um, if people just want to watch some videos of cool kayak fishing, if they go to kayakfishingtales.com, that's our YouTube channel. And we have, I don't know, we've had 16 million views on there or something. Uh, we've got 135 videos, I think, something like that. Um, yeah, I've got a lot. Of, it's, like I said, I've been at this a long time. So, Well, my friend... All the best to you moving forward. Thanks for taking the time to be on the Outdoor Atlas video podcast sessions. I'm Mark Melnick. We'll be right back after this. Peace out. Hi, Mark Melnick here for Fish Hunter and FishHunter.com. I wanted to introduce you to this cool little bit of technology for those of you who love to fish but don't have that big tricked out $70,000 bass boat. This is the Fish Hunter. It is military grade sonar used for seeing what's underneath your boat. It's absolutely perfect for weekend warriors, kayaks, and people that canoe. Now what makes Fish Hunter unique is that it's not married to a screen that you have to mount on your boat. All you need is a smartphone or a tablet, and it communicates perfectly through Bluetooth. All you do is download the app at fishhunter.com, pair your device using Bluetooth once it's in the water, turn it on, and your display begins right away. Now, what you can do is you can either have the raw sonar data come through to your smartphone, or you can actually set it so that you can get the fish view that shows you exactly where the fish are in the waterfall. It's absolutely perfect for those who don't have a big bass boat, but want to see what's underneath so that they can maximize their chances at catching more fish. All right, so there you have it. Our very first Outdoor Atlas video podcast session is in the books. Special thanks to Jim Sammons, the godfather of sea kayaking and kayak fishing. He's been an absolute goldmine to find, and uh, if you ever find yourself down in La Jolla, give him a call. You'll be glad you did. Stay tuned to OutdoorAtlas.com for a list of future upcoming guests, and if you'd like to submit questions for said guests, please feel free to do so on the website. For everybody here at OutdoorAtlas.com, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you on the water.